All right. I'm Jeff Nyquist, and this is Friends and Enemies, and I'm here with my German co-host, uh, Alex Benish. Uh, I'm Jeff Nyquist, um, and today we're going to be talking about the occult, UFOs, and the role in espionage and the Cold War and the ongoing war that's uh, for control of the human destiny. Uh, how's it going, Alex? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing okay. Um I thought we might start by uh, just explaining kind of what the occult, how the occult works. I saw your you had done a video on the occult and espionage, and you were explaining there how occult groups are ideal for infiltrating, ideal for getting people to um, uh, come clean with some information and to recruit people as agents. Maybe you could kind of explain how that works, how the occult world, the world of occult lodges and secret societies, how that uh, helps major industrial uh, espionage in its activities. Well, I mean, um, it's it's basically impossible to tell what came first, the, um, the intelligence, business, or occultism. And if you look at the ancient world and ancient sources um, there's there's really no telling what came first but it always seemed to seem to be connected uh one way one way or the other i mean obviously you had quite a bit of uh, cold activity uh, in the ancient world and uh sometimes people get confused when the term mystery cold is used so uh just so everybody knows that in in let's say ancient rome or in ancient greece there was a, a great var a variety of um, religious systems and cults. Some were more exclusive than others, and uh, some were even very, very much restricted. So, for example, there is um, there there once was this uh, Mithras cult in the Roman Empire, and um, this thing was so secret that nothing survived publicly that would tell us what was going on in these uh, cult meetings uh, that were held in very secluded places, very small um, little temples, sometimes in caves, sometimes in people's basements, uh, very well hidden. And um, we just do not know what they were doing there um, because um, the secrecy was apparently total or um, anything that might have leaked was uh, subsequently tracked down. There is some literature that indicates um, people were very concerned in, in Roman times about some of these cults and they were complaining about it. And then you never heard from these, um, these critics ever again. And so this is kind of the distinction. Not everything that was, um, that was um, um, let's say, uh, a mystery cult in ancient times, uh, not everything was psychopathic and criminal and all that but um you can imagine what happens if um very powerful people uh, come together and um and they have very dangerous ideas about how the the universe works and this of course then ties into the the intelligence business and so when when uh we move further to the present you also have to make i think these distinctions between, let's say, um, some sort of an elite mystery cult from the ancient times that actually survived into into um, our time, uh, something that's very, very elite and very, very secret. Uh, and then you have sort of the mid-level occultism, uh, let's say the L.A. Stokroli types and um, various various groups of that nature. And it's and even with that mid-level occultism, it's tough to actually track. Um, uh, criminal activity, crazy activity, very dangerous activity, uh, and um, and then of course you have the the lowest level I think of occultism, which is just the the dabbling, um, branching out into as various schools of esoteric um, esoteric type systems, and um, I think this is sort of the baseline structure that people should be aware of, um, because sometimes. Uh, dabblers or people who, who just do this in their spare time. Um, some people, they try to get offended or um, they think that um, it's just not understood what they're doing. But um, what I've saw, what I've seen is these academics, for example, um, academics, they try to be scientific. They go through the source material and oftentimes source material is what these occultists have written themselves. So the writings of Aleister Crowley, the writings of 
um, Helena Blavatsky from Russia and, and, and so on. And, and you, you don't imagine these people to write something incriminating on paper. Sometimes they, they did. Um, but if you just try to be very scientific and academic going from these, these original writings, um, you probably won't get to the bottom of this. I think once you start looking at this like um, an intelligence officer would look at this. So you're, you're, you're expecting secret nefarious networks to exist and you're trying to track them down. Um, I think this is a much better approach. Is, you know, I might want to make a comment about um, to show how occult ideas or religious slash occult ideas affect politics. Going all the way back, there is a kind of a common thread. Um, if you go back to Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great's mother told him that uh, he might be half God. Mm. And that uh, his, his mother had this story about how the night that he was conceived, this this godlike spirit, you know, came to her. So he ended up as he was, you know, he was 18 years old when his father um, died, um, Philip of Macedon, and he became the king. And when he had, he had conquered Egypt, he had conquered the, 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 that part of the Persian Empire. He went out to see a, um, a famous, um, uh, I guess you could ca call it a psychic. In those days, they would be an, an oracle. I think it was in some oasis uh, in the desert um, uh, west of the Nile. And, uh, it, and I think you'll find this in Plutarch. And he, had, he admitted to his friends, I think one of whom was one of his generals, this story that he's really partly divine, right? And his friends were shocked that Alexander had this belief about himself. And of course, this belief was turned out to be quite toxic in the biography of Alexander the Great. He ended up dying young, probably, you know, one rumor was he was poisoned by uh, Aristotle because he had murdered Aristotle's uh, nephew. Uh, and he had, he had turned against a lot of his friends who, you know, knew him as a human being, not as a, as a semi-divine. Right. And so then you have this very strange event, this extremely ambitious man, Julius Caesar, who later is ex an extreme fanatic admirer of Alexander the Great, who when he comes to Egypt and teams up with Cleopatra, who is a goddess, you know, uh, Isis in the flesh, so to speak, in Egypt, uh, you know, Cleopatra, the descendant of one of Alexander the Great's generals, of course, Alexander the Great's tomb was there in Alexandria, and they could go and they could look at Alexander and of course, looking at Alexander's grave, you know, Caesar's very moved. Here his mistress is a goddess. Why can't I be a god? And of course, you end up with the deification of the Roman emperors, the deification of Julius Caesar after his death. Um, and, and you have this cult of personality. You, you, you had Hitler in the Third Reich, and you had this cult of personality with Stalin and Mao. This, this almost deification of the great leader is a real factor in politics and and it has this these mystical semi-religious or occult roots which is one example of a belief that you know shows allegiance to a particular leader to a particular party and has significance so that later you have when the roman empire tells the jews you have to you know have an altar to the emperor you have to right. uh, swear allegiance to the emperor uh, and so you have this Jewish revolt, right, where the zealots come out and they're going, we are, we only worship God. We're not going to worship Caesar, right? And then so you Rome have, sent and, its and troops. The, right. And so you have the, the, the famous revolt at 68 AD and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So you have this, this history of wars over these beliefs. So this, this is not something minor because the Jewish wars... Uh, the two big ones in the Roman uh, history were extremely important, and they they play big now when Israel is reestablished in its old territory. Uh, th you know, uh, two thousand years later, uh, and you've got the, these kind of wars, and and you've got a lot of people today. I mean, I had um, uh, when I put up our I linked to the video last week, and uh, they they said you know uh, was Alex. Um, uh, clairvoyant talking about Hamas when when that had happened uh, last Saturday had begun happening but um, 
but it 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 we see that this um, this Middle East thing is so volatile religiously because I had all kinds of people comment on my site quoting Bible scriptures, arguing about who had the right translation of the Bible for, you know, quoting Ezekiel 38 and 39 and talking about Bible prophecy in relation to um, the events that were unfolding in the Middle East. And of course, this is very similar to all kinds of prophecies in the use of not just religious beliefs, but magical belief in general in, yeah. in influencing groups. Um, I, I mean, it's it's notable, um, especially in in the ancient um, the ancient world when um, let's say one empire expanded, and um, an empire was conquering new territory. So it had a new province, or it just outright uh, claimed um, claimed a certain bit of land. Um, it was um, not necessarily not necessarily standard procedure to just tell these new um, these new people that you conquered um, to tell them that your entire religious system is bogus and you have to adopt our system. So um, what happened quite often was that um, the the conquering the conquering nation, the conquering empire, was combining its religion with the religion of the acquired territories. And that's how you saw kind of these stories change. If you look into the ancient mystery cults, um, there's almost 20 variations of every single story. Um, there's 20 variations of every single um, every single character in that story. So these stories were constantly uh, adopted and changed. Now, the basic baseline procedure of these cults, the, the, the baseline was always kind of the same. Um, but um, you could you could tell pretty much that when let's say um, the the Babylonian Empire was expanding, it was suddenly changing these religious stories of the acquired territories, and they were just expanding the role of one of the Babylonian gods and uh, create these family relations of certain uh, certain god figures. And um, if if we apply that yeah, logic, you could call that a kind of that's a kind of ecumenism, where you're yeah. attempting to to merge is like the Greeks and the Romans. The Romans, when they were taking over the Mediterranean, they began to associate their gods with Greek gods. So they would say that, oh, Jupiter is Zeus, and yeah. you know Venus is um, uh, I'm not thinking of their name, the goddess of war there in Greece, um, Athena. So, yeah. so you know, uh, Jupiter is Zeus, Venus is Athena, uh, Mercury is Hermes, you know, this kind of correspondence so that they were trying to make it into one thing. But what ended up happening a lot of the times, as you mentioned, all these cults, is that, um, uh, you know, there's like, I think there's 44,000 different types of Protestantism. Well, there's basically mm. five types of Protestant, but there's 44,000 different de denominations somebody figured out. And the thing is, is that what you ended up in the ancient world is you had these cults just multiplying like crazy. So you had this chaos of gods that had taken place in the late Roman Empire. And you had at the same time, the political authorities wanted to consolidate belief so that people would then they could center the the that that belief in as uh attending to the legitimacy of the political power right and this is something i noticed um um i noticed recently um this was kind of a, a small family vacation so we were in austria and uh we um looked at this what the, the, these things actually exist over here they're called uh torture museums okay so Torture is, museums? Yo, you never heard of torture museums in the United States? <laughs> no, no, I haven't heard of a torture no, museum. No, so uh, basically, you're you're visiting you're visiting one of the castles, right? Um, like a, a very very old castle, and they have this. Um, they have, it's it's like a halfway converted into a museum. So they they tell you about, um, uh, for example, the, the history of torture and how it compares to today. So they would have all these exhibits there. Like really, like really the old. Rack that you'd be stretched out on the all, rack. All kinds of stuff. Yeah, the most crazy screws and all the the, the crazy the craziest. They have the craziest stuff from from all the centuries. And then they have, of course, 
information about uh, how, how this relates to the world today. So they actually quote on these um, on these information boards. They quote stuff from what the Russians are doing, what's going on in the Muslim world, what's going on, and you know, just just everywhere. So. Um, so you you visit this museum, right? And and you you look at these exhibits, and and I I mean to me it was it was kind of striking because in in the ancient world everybody picked picked their own favorite uh, cult and they were doing all these rituals and some of these rituals were not just meant to um, uh, just beg some uh, benevolent god to to help you or to to help your children when they're ill, but sometimes uh, for the general public, this uh, these rituals meant that you were also trying to get the help of a demon. Uh, there's this one instance I think it's from the Roman Empire where um, if your child was sick, you were supposed to do this complicated ritual with a pig. You had to dress up the pig in some sort of way. And the pig had to move in a certain way, and the pig was um, the the pig had a little figurine in its in its mouth, had to carry it around, and then you had to do something else with the figurine. And when it was all said and done, you place uh, the little figure, the little idol, you place it next uh, to your child uh, who's sick in bed, and this is supposed to um, get the help of an actual demon. So it's not a benevolent entity, it's it's a demon, but if you do the right magic, you can sort of benefit from the demon's power for a good cause. So this was even common with the average uh, the average folk. And so move, you know, just going further uh, down the line in in Christian times in Europe, this sort of magic or ancient magic, this was, of course, completely illegal if you were caught performing th that sort of magic um the uh the government would come after you the church would come after you and they would employ these torture devices to gain more information now if you look at just baseline uh, historical uh historical records and um baseline historical analysis uh, they will tell you this was all just misguided and just stupid but to me it seemed more like um on a certain level, it was counterintelligence because uh, we've seen so many occult activities leading up to a rev revolution. For example, the communist revolution um, leading up to the Nazi the Nazi takeover, the right wing in Europe, and especially in Germany, was was very much into the occult. And so, I think that in European history. Um, let's say the the witch burnings and these investigations and and parts of the Inquisition. I think that was also somewhat rooted in counterintelligence because um, the governments at the time they were just concerned that um, revolutionary networks um, they were concerned that that these revolutionary networks existed and they were combining occultism and espionage. And so if you if the government actually heard about uh, some some suspicious activity, they would they would go in investigate um, using every means available and they were questioning these people. So these torture devices, oh, of course. these torture devices oh, were not just there to um, elicit a confession. I mean, that did happen quite a bit. Um, for intimidation, but it was also um, a, a way to extract information. Are you part of to a find network? Find out about a deeper uh, about yeah. a deeper network. Yeah. Are you an occultist? Well, you Are know, you a professional you know, occultist? Do you have a network? Do you have contact people? Are you running any sorts of operations? So I think that was also part of this. Well, I, I, well, of course, you know that the Inquisition was started on account of a of a of a very carefully organized conspiracy slash heresy. The Albigensian Crusade was was when the the Inquisition first started, and um, it was the the Cathar heresy was that the God of the Bible was that was a a sort of demon, a, a demi urge, hmm. or dem, dem, demiurgos, and so this demon. Uh, that created the world, it created a prison in which where all of our souls are trapped. So their theology was very much opposed to Christianity, although they were infiltrating the church. There were bishops, there were there were cardinals, there were very high level 
people belonging to this sect that had infiltrated all over Christendom. And they were particularly strong in the south of France. And um, so they had to um, they had to try to stamp it out because it was like it was like a disease. And of course, it is um, it is a Gnostic related heresy. It is Gnosticism in a very virulent form. And it wasn't only, um, for example, um, Eric Verglin who pointed out that Gnosticism was the main countercurrent to to Christianity, but and and to um, to civilization itself. Going back to ancient, there's more than one form of Gnosticism. There's there's Jewish Gnosticism. There's Christian Gnosticism. There's pagan Gnosticism, um, and of course. Um, you, you, you. It is so. It's inimical. The beliefs of the system are inimical to any, I guess, you could say, uh, civilization or structure-friendly uh, notions. It's it's somewhat communistic in its belief systems, and uh, and and has these uh, Manichaean elements, uh, good versus evil, where what everybody else thinks is good is actually evil. So there's an inversion of good and evil that takes place in this in this cult, and um, it was Carl Jung in his book *Aeon* who associated this heresy, this Albigensian heresy, with modern communism, saying that communism was modern uh, Marxism-Leninism was the ultimate form of the same heresy, just brought up to date with modern science and so on. And you could you could make the claim, you know, Verglund claimed that Nazism, not National Socialism, was really part of the same general movement. Have have you heard some of this before? It it rings it it, it rings a bell definitely because I've I've looked at um, the, the the common roots of national national socialism and socialism, and uh, it's uh, I mean when um, when for example the the Knights the Knights Templars were taken down. Uh, this was a very important event in in history, of course, and um, and so th uh, these arrests were made. Of course, many Templars escaped, but um, those that were arrested were um, tortured, and then you had these um, proceedings. And historians have looked at these records. Now, um, obviously, if you just look at the records, it seems kind of um, uh, it, it it all rings very phony, and and um, this has been interpreted as a, a baseline power struggle between the French king, uh, the Pope, and uh, the the order of the, the Templars. But um, if you look if you look deeper, I think this is a much bigger picture that emerges because um, it, it's when you have these these people taken as as prisoners, and you have the option of torturing them. What questions would you ask them? You would ask questions like, "What? Wh where are your hidden assets? Um, where are your spies? Uh, what operations are you running? Um, what are your long-term plans and strategies?" So you would ask all these kinds of intelligence questions to figure out what kind of a network um, the Templars had built, and and you would ask them about um, occult activity and how far this runs and, and any secret backers and secret support structures. Those are the questions you would ask. But if you just look at the files that were um, um, that are public, the files don't tell you that much. Uh, so uh, apparently the accusations were um, homosexuality and the accusations were about uh, spitting on spitting on the cross. And, and that was almost in every single case was the same were the same charges um, but of course if you if they, if they indeed asked real questions back then you know real intelligence questions back then um, you wouldn't put all this into the official files so you would run a, a double system you would ask the real questions and write down the answers and then you would have sort of the official, documents, the official files, and you just make up some charges and then uh, and file it as as such. But I think that um, there was quite a bit of occultism going on. And this is what the interrogators, I think, were after. And um, some people wrote um, books later on about the subject. And um, I found one of these books in, in my old um, university. I think this was even an original print. And um, so this person who was attached to the Knights Templars, he admitted to certain things. He said, well, yes, 
the with a church investigation they actually did find secret hidden rooms in the homes of templars um, and these secret rooms were containing certain talismans and such and also um, some graves were opened and again these weird talisman type objects were found in those graves that did not belong there so he was admitting to this but he was downplaying it in the book by saying this was all just a big misunderstanding but i think what we what we can witness um you know if if we'll dig a little deeper was a massive counterintelligence operation and also a let's say counter occultism operation So do you think that uh, people would admit to things that weren't true just to get out from under the torture? Um, obviously, obviously, that's that's kind of what um, what can happen. And if, if, of course, you want to elicit force, a, uh, force a confession, you will get a confession, most likely. Um, but um, uh, if, if we look at these people back then as professionals, I think they were going after specific types of information. Now, I don't think that I don't think that most Templars were Templars were in on it, um, but I think they were looking for they were looking for specific networks within the specific, Templars. Yeah, well, certainly the Cathars were a real uh, were a real thing, and they were a real threat. They were huge, um, um, and and of course, there's a relation there, connection there to Bulgaria. There's a connection there to ancient Persia. Um, and of course, there's a connection if Carl Jung and Eric Verglin are right. Um, you know, Jung had a very funny way of explaining this. He said the Antichrist is a real force in history. And he said, we are living at the time of this Antichrist. Um, and he said that the Antichrist movement is the opposite, is, is what is, Antichrist is someone who promises the same thing as Christ that the lion will lie down with the lamb, but he delivers the exact opposite. And that this is what you have with national socialism and with communism. Um, and he, he traced these movements, he called them part of this Antichrist movement through history, which he, he punctuates with the, the Albigensian uh, movement um, and, and shows how it, it, in the Renaissance, you have this occult revival, you have the, the introduction of metaphysics and the Enlightenment reaction to the wars of religion. And then, of course, you have uh, the, the occult revival in the latter 19th century in Europe. And then you, of course, you have the Nazi and communist movements in the 20th century. And Jung was connecting these things as part of a rising madness in Western society. He was basically saying, this is this is one of the things that um, I realized when I was doing my book, Origins of the Fourth World War, was that, you know, people say, oh, you're just all about Galitzin. You're all about just um, the Russians did this fake. Well, that that's one important mm -hmm. data point about the Russians having this plan to fake the collapse of communism, that, that deception was so big with the Russians. But the bigger thing was, is that Marx's ideology and more specifically Lenin, there is a psychology of destructionism in Marx and Lenin. So destruction of the truth at every opportunity. It's like, why did they lie about that? They even lie when it doesn't seem to matter because the truth is the enemy. And then you have weapons of mass destruction. And whenever they do their war thing, and even when they're at peace, you know, communism killed 100 million people by some counts in the 20th century um, in China, in Russia, in Cambodia, in Africa. Uh, this is a this is a tremendous death toll in peacetime, let alone in wartime. So you look at you look at Ukraine; it's almost senseless. The Ukrainians will will uh, will bomb a a Russian supply depot where where they've got howitzer shells stored, and the Russians will will counterattack by firing missiles at a gas station, a supermarket, or an apartment block. Right. So they're they're using terror. They're killing civilians. You saw with Hamas, they're killing civilians. It's about destruction, murder. I mean, they, the Israelis actually, when somebody challenged them on these babies heads being chopped off, they then published the pictures. I mean, this is hmm. it's just it's it's mind boggling. Right. The, the evil. But um, so what I realized was that this counter movement against like 
normal cosmological thinking, you know, uh, a loving God made us, put us here. Uh, we've got uh, this structured civilization and we've got these rules to live by, but they're against all of it. They're Burning. against God, they're against civilization, they're against society. They want to, you know, the, the Albigensians, it's like, um, destroy the world, destroy mankind. We got to escape from the world. We got to leave it all behind. Um, it's all evil. You know, everything that we know as good, they say is evil. And so then you get to Karl Marx and Lenin, and it's it's just a different way of saying it. When you go to Marx, you know, you go to Hegel's dialectic, it's it's abstraction, negation, um, and and then you you have uh, the synthesis, the new abstraction or the new reality. With Marx, he makes it, he turns it on its head, you know, as materialism. I mean, if, if idealism is the true philosophy of behind all true religion and behind all true philosophy, and now they're saying in physics it's true, uh, then materialism is the ultimate lie. So Marx says, no, it's not idea that you start with an, an abstraction. You start with a concrete in reality and you negate. You criticize, criticize, criticize reality. You, you, you critique reality, and then that leads to the revolution, to the destruction of mm -hmm. reality. So you can make a new reality, and you can be the god, the, the destroyer god, who creates by destroying. And this is, when you realize this is what's going on, you look at you know, weapons of mass destruction and, and weapons of mass deception, and you go, holy crap, this is bad. Yeah, and I noticed this, I noticed this interesting trend. So before the before the communist revolution um the 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 socialist movement um the socialist movement was full of occultism and some of these uh, more well-known communists um they were even more open about it they were writing about it um uh, i think mikhail bakunin and some of these guys uh they were pre pretty dark and so you saw all this occultism going on then the revolution is achieved and once this happened and the new communist government had um, solidified, they actually made it illegal for the average citizen in Russia, especially in, in, in Soviet Russia, um, they made it illegal for the average citizen to have these occultist groups, to f create new groups or to join a group and to have this sort of activity. So it's interesting to see how um, occultism is being used and you have the religion but then it becomes illegal for most because the new government does not want um, the new government does not want resistance. They they want to prevent somebody else using occultism against this new order. And so, um, th kind of uh, this this occultism survived sort of in the KGB. So there's quite a bunch of uh, interesting. Um, uh, quite a bunch of interesting anecdotes about people inside the KGB who were quite into the occult. And um, you have the Lenin mausoleum and, and all that stuff. But for the average citizen, it was for a long time was pretty much forbidden to engage in occult activity. And uh, uh, this changed uh, in 19, 1991. And then it became such a big thing in Russia. And now it seems to have gotten out of control somewhat. And we're getting information out of Russia. They are trying to uh, ban certain groups. Um, and uh, make certain groups illegal. They can't make anything illegal overnight because it's such a big phenomenon in Russia. And there were some government and and orthodox officials in Russia um, fairly recently, and they made this claim that the United States and Ukraine uh, were using occultism or what they call Satanism against Russia uh, to conduct acts of sabotage and whatnot. So basically everybody who is who's fighting uh, the Russian government now, according to Russia, is a Satanist, of course. That's what they're claiming. But um, it's interesting to see that this phenomenon um, was was out of control in Russia. And now they're trying to put this all, put the genie back in the bottle some, uh, in some way. And this is also something well, I noticed. it's better than a real witch hunt, right? <laughs> if, you, if you really want to find find the real witches or find the enemy, you have a witch hunt, your enemy is going to be found somewhere in there, right? Yeah. yeah Make everybody but... paranoid. And then if everybody's paranoid, who can get away with anything, right? Exactly. And uh, this is something I also noticed about the National Socialists 
the right wing the right wing circles in uh, Germany and Austria um, as early as the 1800s. I think it really started around 1850. Uh, it became occultism became such a big thing. And um, and and once the Nazis actually took power, there was this order that um, occultist groups are now um, occultist groups for everybody um, are now illegal. So the the only organizations you can join are national socialist organizations, and if you were a more powerful Nazi party member, you could get sort of a special permission to engage in occultism, but this was limited to a specific group. But the average citizen was no longer allowed um, to um, uh, to dabble in occultism. So again, it, well, before had, a revolution, you had similar, yeah, you had something similar in ancient Rome. You had uh, if you go to the uh, Tacitus or Suetonius about Tiberius. Tiberius was a major uh, consultant of astrologers. And yet he would outlaw, they would outlaw astrology, they would outlaw uh, occult practices in Rome. And yet um, Tiberius would invite astrologers to his uh, place by the coast, and he, where he had, uh, he would take them to the roof of his house, which was on the edge of a cliff. And he would bring them there, and he would have this enormous bodyguard nearby, who was given orders to throw the astrologer off the roof if he gave the wrong answer. And of course, he would have the astrologer cast his own, look at his own horoscope. And if, he, if the astrologer didn't see that he was at a crisis point in his life and maybe about to die, he would have him thrown off the roof. Um, but they would, it was like um, the leaders wanted access to occult and secret information but they didn't want the public to have it. And they also realized that if an astrologer predicted that the emperor would, was going to die, it was a serious problem for the emperor because it might make that prophecy might be self-fulfilling. Right. So, yeah, that's, that's, it's restricted. Sometimes it's, it's very restricted and sometimes um, it's used to uh, uh, make people angry and it's used to get people moving. And uh, when, of course, when this pattern becomes sort of a thing, right, using using occult groups uh, for espionage purposes and for revolutionary purposes, if this is a known principle, of course, what happens, uh, intelligence networks, they try to get in on the game. Um, and sometimes intelligence operatives, they will even start these kind of groups. And I think this is what, hap what happened with uh, the Golden Dawn and the OTO, for example. So, um, like this, the, this group, the, the Auto Templi Orientis OTO, was created somewhere in Germany or Austria between 1895 and 1906. And um, it looks like um, these groups were made for espionage purposes. So you, you create this organization and then you expand its, its activities, you expand what kind of occult systems they're into. So there's something for everybody. And then what these uh, organizations did was they created these new lodges, these new chapters, and then they tried to uh, jump across the border and move into, into the, uh, the territory of the competing empires and then you make connections and maybe you can recruit sources and on and, and all that stuff so um there was um this text from dr richard b spence from the university of idaho he looked at alistair crowley <clears throat> and apparently alistair crowley was a british spy who infiltrated the golden dawn and also the oto and uh so this was about um figuring out these subversive plans because uh, some of these uh, some of these uh, networks, they try to destabilize Britain, reinstall the Stuart line to the throne and make Britain Catholic again. So and and for that purpose, there were um, uh, operations going on in Ireland. And, and this was always tied to these occult organizations. And what Alistair Crowley did was he would infiltrate these groups, he would gain information, and then he would relay this uh this information to british intelligence so this is something that uh, i think people should be really really aware of um how this game was played in europe um at that at that time at that point in time uh there was also some german operations against the united states 
And uh, so this this was um, before World War One. I. I mean, some people may be familiar with this. Um, there was um, quite a bit of sabotage going on. Uh, German agents, German assets, they were trying to uh, blow up anything they could in the United States. Um, ammunition depots, ammunition factories, anything of, of any value uh, was was attacked. And uh, the, the, this was German intelligence behind this the, behind the sabotage. And this is also something that Mr. Crowley had infiltrated. And um, and uh, um, somebody who was tasked with investigating that sabotage was uh, the infamous John J. McCloy, very mysterious figure who then. Uh, became after World War II, he became sort of the man in charge of the occupied territories of Germany. And uh, he did all kinds of stuff. He was um, scaling up the United States military and so on and so forth. Uh, so yeah, this is this is actual intelligence operations. In this case, it was sabotage um, against the Americans um, and against Britain, operations against Britain and Aleister Crowley. He infiltrated uh, these networks going through these occult uh these occult connections it's just very very interesting um and it, and it is and it is it is true of course that um crowley kind of invented his own religion and was uh, and and seemed very serious about um using occult ideas which involve just to explain to the audience a lot of occult ideas involve uh systems of correspondence and, and it's almost like a, a schizophrenic use of metaphor to try to invoke supernatural entities or powers or synchronicities or to cause things to happen. Um, we, we should just sort of lay that out there that, that whatever form of magic or occultism you're looking at, there's always a system of correspondences. Um, like we were, I was talking about uh, pagan gods, for example, pagan gods being related to different planets, right? You have the planet Venus, you have the planet Mars, you have the planet Saturn. These are names of gods. The sun, Apollo is a god, is the sun god. So you have these correspondences and all of these also relate to astrological symbols and the zodiac and so on and so forth so that everything has a correspondence to everything else and you have systems of symbols that are used and then the manipulation of those symbols can supposedly change reality change things in reality that's just to, to give a, a basic explanation and of course um this was this was part of what they try to do in these magical rituals but it also is very funny that there is a political side to this that uh, that also guess what symbols are very important to empires they're very important to military organizations um and that the manipulation of the symbol look at um the symbols that hitler created the swastika which had already existed as a symbol but he had it turned in a funny way and you have um of course it's a red flag just like the soviet flag is a red flag He's got a mustache, like Stalin has a mustache. Uh, I think it was Viktor Suvorov that pointed out these correspondences that uh, that um, so Hitler's niece, who he supposedly had some kind of romantic infatuation with, was killed with uh, with his revolver. She supposedly shot himself. Stalin supposedly shot herself with his revolver, uh, and so on. There's this system of correspondences. I guess somebody made something of the fact that Hitler's father at one time was a a, sh a shoemaker like Stalin's father was at one time a shoemaker so on and both of their fathers beat them etc so um you have these weird attempts at correspondences and people find these correspondences to be very spooky like i think i mentioned the correspondence between the deaths of president kennedy and president lincoln here in the u.s um these correspondences shockingly exist and what are we to make of that? Yeah. And so if we put ourselves mentally in the position of uh, the, if, if, if we look back at the Cold War, so how would, for example, um, how would the Soviets try to um, infiltrate Western Europe and especially the United States 
by using occultism, by using um, occult groups. Now, um, in America, this in America, occultism um, got a big boost in the 1960s. So, with all the the, the new music and the rebellious. Um, the rebellious symbology and all that, and and uh, then this uh, Church of Satan was founded, uh, which partially was a publicity stunt, but it was also meant to get people into this further to make it um, to to create this entry point. It's uh, almost like a, a front organization for something for something larger and something bigger. And um, uh, when. When the uh, so when the Church of Satan was founded, um, police then over the years uh, police noticed an increase in occultist crime and occultist activity. Um, so it definitely had some sort of an effect. And um, when people get into this, so they may start with let's say the Church of Satan, or they buy this this book by Anton Lavey, the the Satanic Bible. This may be somebody's entry point because at some point they have exhausted everything that's that's in the satanic bible and they want to look further they want more light so to say or more enlightenment uh in in an occult sense and so then they might start looking at what what else is out there and um one thing i noted about uh the church of satan uh is something i had not been previously aware of and uh and it's and it's this. So um, when the Church of Satan was founded, um, one particular um, founding member c- called my attention, and this was the Danish Baroness Karen de Plessen. So she grew up in the royal palace of Denmark. She was born in Copenhagen, Denmark. Very old family, uh, about one thousand years old. They started out in Saxony, then they moved to um, uh, they moved to Mecklenburg in Germany, northern Germany, and then Denmark, which is a bit further to the north, uh, Denmark and Holstein. And um, their original place, the original place they controlled, uh, the original place then was um, was under the rule of the House of Hessen Kassel. So you're talking about some of the most uh, influential old families. Uh, these families at some point defined the British throne and also the Russian Tsarist throne. So here we have somebody from a very, very old family, um, more like more than a thousand years old, somebody attached to the throne of Denmark. And um, it's it's likely that this person had access to um, more elite circles, let's say maybe ancient mystery cult type stuff. And um, so she looks to me like a possible link between a an actual elite and then sort of a, a, a lower level front organization such as the Church of Satan. So the Church of Satan was not giving away any um, any any secrets of the old mystery cults. So it she was, joined the Church of Satan? Um, she was a founding member, yeah. A Danish baroness. A Danish baroness, is, Karen de Plessen. She was a well, founding it's member. Interesting. When, when I was listening to your piece on it, and I read a little bit about LaVey, his actual statements are very Gnostic. Mm-hmm. It's a very Gnostic sect. Just as uh, one of my readers connected to this researcher on Islam and I'd never heard this before, that Islam is officially a Gnostic religion. Because they believe that the creator God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, is a demon, hmm. or, or like a de- demiurgo. So it's like I had not run across that. In all my readings on Islam, I had not seen that before. Um, so you have, there almost is like this line and Verglin, you know, Verglin, people have attacked Verglin for, you know, everything's about Gnosticism and with you. And he said, look, if I had, you know, and he pointed to these authorities that he was referring to, if I'd come up with this on my own, I'd be the greatest, you know, scholar in the Mm. history of the world. But I didn't, I basically, these other people discovered all this stuff about Gnosticism. I'm just connecting it to all these political movements and, and and he he makes a very good point that there is this 
struggle. So, and it, it, it is Manichaean because Manichaean kind of division of good and evil runs through all of these belief systems. Uh, so you've got Anton LaVey in the Church of Satan making it about um, uh, the devil being a good guy, right? Satan's is, is actually misunderstood, according yeah. to Anton LaVey. Um, and of course, this this brings this brings up something that's um, that you mentioned about the occult revival in America. If you go to American bookstores, the occult books are in the metaphysical, often they call it metaphysical section, where the UFO books are. Mm -hmm. And I should point out, say, well, how would the Russians, how would the Soviets be uh, interested in exploiting these kind of things, uh, especially after World War II? And then you have, right after World War II, 1947, this uh, flying saucer hysteria that begins with Kenneth Arnold citing UFOs uh, over Washington State from his airplane to the Roswell crash, you know, two weeks later, and in at the um, what is it the, um, the the Fulton Ranch in Lincoln County, New Mexico, and uh, and and there's this book by a Nick Redfern called Flying Saucers from the Kremlin, and he's done an amazing research. Uh, he he kind of gives an offhand. Um, he, he tries not to sound like a McCarthyist, and he, he goes he goes back pedals backwards to try to explain why there was concerns about the communists. But he's got um, he he's he's looked into the declassified files, and he's found that uh, after these this first two weeks of incidents of flying saucers being seen everywhere, uh, an FBI special agent named Reynolds went and interviewed uh, Army Air Corps Intelligence uh, Chief General Shogun. And Shogun told Reynolds that the first flying saucer reports that kind of triggered the whole thing off had communist, were people with communist connections. And that the military was extremely concerned that um, Soviet agents were had been instructed to spread these rumors in order to exploit them, in order to create... Um, certain thoughts in people's heads and even to form organizations like you say occult organizations um and sure enough when you get into the contactees the 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 people who a few years later claimed that they were talking to aliens the flying saucers had landed like george Ademsky, again you find connections to the kgb and to mysterious figures who ended up it, on the one hand, they were interested in ufos but they ended up spying for the soviet government and some of some of them ended up disappearing Mm. mysteriously kidnapped you know uh supposedly in to meet flying saucer aliens but probably kidnapped by the kgb because maybe they knew too much which is 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 all in nick redford's fern's book and uh and then there's more it's about roswell and annie jacobson which i've mentioned before about stalin being annie jacobson's interview with an old uh scientist american scientist saying Roswell was done by Stalin. Well, I mean the I mean, uh, the the United I mean the United States Air Force was very concerned uh, about the UFO activist movement for obvious reasons because these activists they would camp out uh, near these military uh, facilities, uh, especially in the desert where the Air Force was testing experimental aircraft and the first stealth plane and and, and all this stuff, and they were also working on 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 other things. Um, new ways of uh, radio communications and all that sort of stuff. And so these UFO activists, they became uh, quite inventive. So they would not just um, uh, carry around cameras everywhere. Some of them would actually hop into a small airplane and fly around in the hopes of finding a, a wrecked, crashed airplane. And so... Um, there's um, there's this book out. It's called Mirage Men. I think this was, this was even turned into a, a documentary. And so this t kind of tells you part of that that whole history. And um, and this one guy, I think it was was Benevitz. He uh, he was he was becoming obsessed with this UFO topic. And um, he was flying around in a plane and he was photographing uh, something that could have been an experimental aircraft. And so the Air Force then decided to 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 work him they 
kind of made him believe he was on the right track and it was UFOs and aliens and he ended up insane. Um, he had a mental breakdown of some sort. And something else that the uh, Air Force uh, was doing, especially the um, what they call FOC, uh, the um, special special branch of the of the Air Force, um, they would spread false documents, uh, give them to these UFO activists, and in exchange they would demand um, actual intel from these UFO activist circles. So this is kind of this 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 thing what you just mentioned. You make up phony intelligence you make up phony stuff and then you trade it for something real um and uh so some of these ufo activists they became quite famous they had these best-selling books and they were um, putting information in this uh, in these books that was supposedly secret um, they had the special documents they were becoming famous for it but in exchange they had to give the air force actual intelligence what was going on in the UFO uh, movement? Who had new information? Uh, who had new photographs? Who may have a source in government telling them something? And so this became this, this wild um, cat and mouse game in, in UFO circles. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's, that was basically the, the motivation of the Air Force because they were afraid that the Russians would actually infiltrate these UFO guys, and this would, would have been, of course, the obvious choice for the Russians to do so. Yeah, the, U, the UFO thing, look at the uh, Stephen Greer and the UFO disclosure movement. What, they're, what are they really trying to do? They're trying to get access to U.S. military secrets, secret weapons, uh, new technology, cutting-edge physics, the claiming that these things are derived from crashed UFOs which is what we're hearing. And of course, uh, um, there, there's, a, there's a problem here. Stephen Greer, you talk about occultism, he has this protocol. He gets people to come to his uh, camps or whatever they are, his, uh, his events, and to learn to meditate, to mm -hmm. communicate with the saucers and the people sit around and they summon, by meditating, they summon UFOs to appear in the sky, right? What is, does this sound like, uh, contact with real aliens or does this sound like occultism yeah yeah and of course um I've, as you said you go into a bookstore and you find the you know that's a special section and you get esoteric books occult books you get ufo books and you get some maybe some conspiracy books this is all sort of tied together people are into usually all of these things um most oftentimes and um it's the easiest way to have sort of a uh, an experience right the, the easiest way is to take psychedelic drugs and this has become fairly popular even in right-wing circles um in europe in the united states uh, so for example um uh, you see a heavy influence in western europe of these uh, russian guys like alexander dugin so they uh they tell people to um, uh, connect to the connect to the past and 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 have these experiences. And um, in the United States, the, um, parts of the right wing in America they are getting heavily into psychedelic drugs. So you see all kinds of famous that's, people. That's now. surprising. Is this happening in Germany too? Oh yeah, sure. It's it's coordinated basically. It's um... so of course uh, the psychedelic drugs. I I know the the rock group, the Doors, right? It's the Doors of Perception, and um, so the idea is you use psychedelic drugs to open the doors to the other dimension, the other world, to the world beyond, and then you can communicate with them. You know what is it you're communicating with? Spirits, angels, demons. What, what is it that they're trying to do by taking psychedelics? They're trying to access power? Yeah, and something that um, always pops up in UFO, uh, UFO activist circles is uh, this idea of inter interdimensional beings. So that's, this is supposedly how these aliens uh, cross through the universe and they, they actually manage to travel these insane distances. They have sort of this this cheat code. They can they they are so advanced they can just switch between um, dimensions. And of course, there's there's legitimate research about multiple dimensions. But for so basically, the, the aliens, the aliens just uh, they take the shortcut here through hell. 
Something like that, yeah. And so <laughs> some people who are practicing occultism and who are also into this UFO alien stuff, it it it's interlocked. It's really interlocked. And so um, if people get into this movement, psychedelic drugs inevitably will um, increase the plasticity of your brain. And that means you are more willing to accept new ideas or to reinforce ideas that you already had. So back in the old days when um, when the CIA was experimenting with uh, psychedelics, especially LSD, um, they were just they were also testing many other substances and they had um, different ideas what substances can do for intelligence purposes. And um, usually what these uh, books on the matter talk about is is um, they were hoping for a truth serum. And at some point, LSD was a, a, a candidate for a, a possible truth serum. But of course, this this didn't pan out. Um, but what uh, what the researchers were able to find out was that you can increase somebody's um plasticity of the brain and you can just just pour your your propaganda into this person and this propaganda will have a more lasting effect now when the cia was basically done with lsd and they had no longer any any real interest in it um this is when of course the 19 the 1960 rock movement or hippie movement um they were getting into lsd and uh this sort of created this impression um, in in mainline America that these sort of drugs would turn you into a, a leftist person. But as it turns out, you can use these kind of drugs to um, create any sort of ideological person. So nowadays, it's the green movement that's getting into um, psychedelics quite a bit. Um, everybody is uh, sort of uh, trying this. And um, it's when when the propaganda is dangerous, of course, uh, then it becomes like like a real problem. And um, it's it, I see this all the time. People are interested in baseline standard conspiracy media. They're also interested in UFOs and aliens. They're interested in occultism, and they're also pro-Russian. So this this happens quite a lot. And um, you you do have well, to think of. Yeah, that's the thing that, that, that bothers me, is how often when I listen to Stephen Greer, you've got almost a peacenik, you know, we, we're, we're going to get free energy from the alien technology, mm. and free energy is anti-capitalist, right? The capitalists, we, we've had the secret of free energy, and the evil capitalists have kept, you know, by, have kept it all away from us. And, and, and you know, it's very funny if if somebody had a free energy device they're supposedly always going to be murdered but the problem is is well well where's the proof of this device when has anybody really demonstrated it and um and and of course this is where you get into this conspiracy literature and and it's like it's tailor-made for the communists and it has this gnostic you know the system is bad the man is against you you know god is the devil evil is good and good is evil again this theme emerges on top mm -hmm. <clears throat> and something i noticed as well when it can when it comes to this uh this uh ufo activist movement it's it to me it's sort of a parallel to what empires uh did in the in the ancient world i mentioned this um earlier when you try to combine different nationalities you try to combine um, these different peoples that you've conquered you have to combine their religions so you just make up connections that didn't exist before you sort of tell the story that it's it's always been interconnected it's it's always been like this one thing and um so apply if we apply this sort of concept to the alien ufo movement it looks like it looks like somebody is trying to uh, create a common thread and connect different types of religions uh, tie them together and also it seems to be designed to get people back into the sort of religion game people who have dropped out people who have been disappointed in religion and uh, so by introducing this idea of these aliens who supposedly created us or co-created us and these aliens, we have to listen to them. They are our masters, our spiritual masters, and, and we have to serve them. Um, so 
this is how you can create a common thread and and try to please everybody. So um, I've heard these interpretations that um, the uh, that Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and all other religions um, this this idea that they sort of derive from alien visitation. And so the, um, the the miracles and and all these things are interpreted as alien technology. And so Erich we, von Däniken. Erich von Däniken. So we all have the same thing in common. And even if you're bored by regular uh, religion, I think many people who got into this UFO stuff and this ties into this Erich von Däniken stuff about the old pyramids and, and that sort of thing that the aliens did this. Um, it gets people back into this religious game, so you get these people back who have been uh, who who grew disinterested in religion, and so you tie this all together, and by creating this sort of hybrid monstrosity of a cult, who is in charge of this cult? Well, it appears that well, one, it's these influencers, specific people who are who are the authoritarian voices of the movement they are sort of in charge but then of course what about governments that uh for example pretend they have special alien contacts and knowledge so let's right. let's let's play this so let's let's run the scenario in our heads so what if the russians stage things what if the russians um have um convinced people that that they um have a special connections to the aliens so it's always a question of, it's always a question of who is running this cult who can who can define uh what people are supposed to do because if, if i read some of these um some of these ufo books uh for example it's uh, the one by uh richard richard dolan um so this name so this guy was um I was told that he he's wrote a this. He's historian, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's supposed to be very scientific, he's, and he's giving you all he's these a professor, all these examples. And um, so I I've, I was reading the second volume of his uh, two volume series of Alien Visitation, Alien Crashes, and um, there's no interpretation yet uh, from him in those books. He 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 did this other book, and people were apparently uh, somewhat disappointed by this other book. Because in his two volume series, he doesn't really give give us any idea who these aliens are, what they want, are they a threat, are they of any help? What's what's the end game? What's going on here? So um, this is sort of the the area where um, it will be decided who is running the movement or who is able to steer the movement in a certain direction. Um, because well, if people I, uh, believe would... in it. And there's an authority yeah. saying we have proof, we have the special connection. Are people going to follow that uh, authority? Yeah, I read volume one of Dolan's uh, thing. So you read volume two, but then I skipped ahead and I read his, he wrote two speculative books. One was about breakaway civilizations and, and this technology. And the other was about aliens and what their agenda might be. And what you learn from this is the guy has very left wing. He's sort of a typical American left wing professor. And so he has these views, which Verglund would call Gnostic, basically. He doesn't like the system. He doesn't like capitalism. He doesn't like the Pentagon. He doesn't like the military industrial complex. So all of these evaluations enter into his um, way of writing his interpretation so he then goes and he accepts that there are aliens and he accepts that there's this big u.s government cover-up which there may or may not be when the evidence is so ambiguous and when as you say this intelligence game is going on and he does not by any means accept that there's anything wrong with the soviet union or um, that we had a really dangerous situation that russia and china are still dangerous today that this is sort of part of an ongoing game he doesn't look at any of that and it seems to me, you know, someone like a researcher like Jacques Valli, who does look at that and who wrote UFOs in the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War and saw there was some strange things going on and the Russians were engaging in deception, hmm. um, is much superior to Dolan because Dolan has an axe to grind. He is hmm. a lefty. Um, and that's disappointing because when you read someone, you want them to be objective. 
Yeah. And you want them to be aware of the pitfalls and the dangers because there is a, you know, I'm, I want my country to survive, of course, but I want to be objective. I want to be true about what is real and what isn't. Oh, by the way, um, because you've, you've uh, talked about this, um, uh, this, this idea that um, uh, aliens, alien civilizations are much more advanced than we are. And these alien civilizations are supposedly, yeah, like a communist system. So, uh, I, I mean, every time you look at somebody's idea of, of these aliens or you watch a movie that's um, based on, on, let's say, UFO literature or that, that, that stuff, it's always that these aliens are um, th that these aliens have sort of a communist system. So it's not about the individual, and they have um, surpassed uh, they have surpassed any notion of capitalism and individualism. Um, and uh, and this is something you find over and over and over again. Uh, so, for example, when uh, the f famous director James Cameron, when he was making the sequel to the um, 1979 movie Alien by Ridley Scott, um, when the sequel was done in, in 1986, people noticed a very strong um, undertone of communism in, in Cameron's movie. And so, and Cameron even admitted to that. He was sort of getting this, his idea from the, uh, the Viet Cong, right? So, um, Apparently, in James Cameron's mind, the Viet Cong were the uh, the communist uh, Viet Cong were the liberators, the underdogs. Um, they didn't think in individualistic terms. They were not capitalist. They were just focused on the goal and and the common uh, the common um, uh, mission. And in the movie, you see um, these um, colonial marines, as they are called, and they represent in the movie, they represent everything that America is supposedly about. So the driving force is a corporation, the Wayland yutani Corporation, but the government is uh, partnering with them. They're sending these colonial marines to this um, planet that is supposed to be uh, colonized by humans. Uh, because there's an alien outbreak in the colony. So then these colonial marines move in and they're, they're very gung-ho and they think they can squash the enemy, squash those aliens. But this low-tech alien enemy is pretty much defeating the American military force. And this was a clear uh, parallel to um, James Cameron's interpretation of the Vietnam War. So the low-tech guys... Uh, supposed freedom fighters, they beat the mechanized American capitalist superpower. And so, um, yeah, this was one movie depiction of, let's say, communist um, guerrilla aliens, so to say. And there's many, many more examples. I mean, Cameron always tried to be a communist, but he spectacularly failed because he created so much <laughs> business, so much business for the movie studios. And um, yeah, he's he's also he he was kind of pro gun for for a while. I mean, he was really fascinated by firearms and uh, and those things. And there's always some sense of um, his movies always have some um, uh, some real focus on families. Even his uh, 1986 movie Aliens. There's also a very interesting undertone about family so he tries so desperately to be a communist and even these aliens are communist and this is sort of the what same you can thing find in over the terminator over. movies same thing in the terminator movie i mean he ends up you know the terminator is taken from the that whole movie the idea of it's taken from the 12th chapter of the book of revelation people don't realize that you have in in the in you have the satan trying to devour uh, basically the Virgin Mary before she can give birth to Christ. Mm. So you have John Connor, J.C., is about to be given birth by his mother, Sarah Connor, right? And so the, the, the monster, the robot, the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator character comes through a time machine back to kill the mother of its enemy. Well, this is straight out of the Bible. 
So Cameron has taken something. A lot of people didn't realize what it was. And of course, you have almost a recreation of the Holy Family in its own way mm. in Cameron's twisted kind of version of it. And of course, it makes it because he's using these religious symbols, which may not be conscious in people's minds, he's actually reaching this larger audience. Um, and, um, and of course, he's talking about apocalypse, about a nuclear kind of apocalypse, only robots, demonic, uh, satanic uh, AI are taking over everything. Uh, what, what is it called? Skynet. Mm. Um, but what, you, what is disturbing about fiction is where the left wing themes were more subtle, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Now it's just overtly in your face, woke um, propaganda, you know, like the morning show about how all these feminist women heroes promoting abortion, you know, killing babies, um, as if that's a heroic, you know, you know, smuggling abortion pills over the Mexican border is a news story that mm -hmm. deserves to be covered. And it's so heroic, making uh, people who are promoting abortion into heroes. It's so strange to me that this is in, of course, one of the major characters who's supposedly from a Christian conservative you know, West Virginia family that's, of course, very dysfunctional and, and full of alcohol and drug abuse, um, she becomes a lesbian. Mm -hmm. You know, th these kind of sensational um, but very Gnostic themes to show that everything's dysfunctional and this world is bad and we have to revolt against it. And, we have to t and the truth is that uh, everything you know is wrong and we have to turn everything upside down to make it right side up. I mean, this is the theme. Yeah, and the, again, the aliens, again, the, the aliens will solve all our problems. They will solve all these questions, apparently. And uh, I think even I think even George Lucas with his Star Wars movies, I think he even shared the same um, the historic view with uh, James Cameron. I think that uh, in some on some level, um, the rebels in the rebels in Star Wars are also based on. Uh, some communist movements, liberation movements, and the um, the the evil empire, uh, the evil empire in Star Wars um, is based on many things. For example, the National Socialists, but also people notice, of course, that um, these empire officers they're talking in a very posh uh, British accent. So this is a clear jab at the old British Empire. And so um, on some level, you can interpret it as, well, the rebels in Star Wars, um, they're like the um, they're like the American rebels, you know, gaining liberty from from the uh, from the British Empire. But in some interviews, George Lucas actually um, betrayed some very, very left leaning interpretations um, of history. And uh, in uh, there was another example it was, um, yeah, I mean, the, the original Alien movie by uh, Ridley Scott from uh, 1979, it was more subtle. Um, I, 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 admit, I admit that, but sprinkled throughout the movie, uh, it, Alien, are um, these, these capitalist uh, logos from the company, the corporation, Wayland yutani And so this, this, this corporation... Um, wants to get this uh, alien specimen for bioweapons research to make money. And the crew is expendable. They sent they uh, sent the crew to this planet. They get infected with this alien specimen. And uh, the company wants uh, that the specimen is returned back to Earth. So this is sort of a... The, the, sh the spaceship in the movie is sort of a microcosm... So you have like the you have the captain who probably makes the most money and he has to be the liaison between the higher ups in the company and the workers on the ship. Uh, then you have sort of below the captain, you have the uh, the communications people and the um, uh, sort of the the other officers. And and below that, you have the mechanics. So in, in the movie logic, the mechanics, they're paid the least amount of money. And uh, you see this sort of weird class warfare going on in this stupid spaceship. And then it becomes this bigger, uh, sort of this, this bigger class warfare. And um, 
yeah, and, and the main character then blows up the entire ship. So destroying all this value to the company and also destroying this uh, destroying this this alien organism. So it because it she 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 basically the science officer who was an agent of the government was really a robot who you find out when she has a fight with him mm. and and she tears off his arm or whatever and this white fluid comes out and he's really he's just a machine. Yeah, um, and he admires the aliens. It, he he admires the yeah, aliens. Yeah, he admires or, them. Yeah. What, what does he call? What does he call it? Um, I admire I admire its purity. He says. Something it's like that. Yes. Unclouded, yes. unclouded by delusions of morality. This is this is almost like an occultist, uh, almost like an occultist view. You know, you want to be a highly elevated type of uh, creature that is not clouded by illusions of morality. That was mm. um, that was uh, one of the creations of the company. This this artificial human being, this this android, and and later, yeah, uh, later uh, Ridley Scott made the sequel movie, um, which he called Prometheus, and this is almost like taken out of the the old books by Erich von Däniken. So the story is these alien engineers, they created us or co-created us. And uh, once humanity evolved and created spaceships, the humans, they wanted to go into space and find these engineers um, to gain access to these secrets and, um, you know, eternal life and, and, and all this stuff. So basically become like the gods or become at least as powerful as these alien uh, aliens who created us. So that was then the, the sequel movie. Yeah, and of course, the the themes we find in ufology are almost taken from bad science fiction. So much of it, if you if you look at Stephen Greer, it's almost impossible with the disclosure movement. The things he talks about are almost they are so. You know, I wrote a piece about this a few months back. It is so bad, and of course, he's been accused of lying and distorting, and he's got a rather checkered past, actually himself in and making claims that are not true. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is the, this is the real tee off that you're looking at disinformation when you're looking at information that's been cooked. You know? Yeah. I mean, and I mean, what, yeah, what, what's, what, um, many of these activists are saying is that they are really world-class investigators. So, they are the ones who expose the secret. They are spy masters. They have sources. They acquire bits of intelligence. They um, they recruit sources or they they get uh, contacted by sources. And so they're they're claiming nothing less than being world class, you know, spies, intelligence people. And uh, when I look at when I look at the material they put out, um, the stuff that was popular in the 80s that was then turned into a television show, The X-Files, you know, with the FBI agents uh, Mulder and Scully, and then the stuff in the 90s, uh, or yeah, there, there, was, there was in the 90s stuff, and um, then Cooper's book came out, Behold a Pale Horse, which was sort of heavily in, into this alien stuff. And, uh, and of course, now this book by or this two volume series by Richard Dolan, when I look at this material, I see that um, they do not possess um, the well, um, the expertise of an intelligence person, an intelligence uh, officer, a spy. So in, in, in my opinion, they're making all these mistakes. They are especially Dolan, he's absolutely convinced that he's on the right track. And even if many, many things get exposed as fake or it gets exposed that um, the United States Air Force was infiltrating the movement and supplying false uh, documents and these documents were hailed as, as real, even when these, uh, let's say, intelligence failures happen, they don't really learn from it, these activists. So they always go back to this um, standard procedure. They say, well... If this if this thing was fake, it it shows that the government tries to uh, spread disinformation. Therefore, it must there must be something real behind it, or they claim um, this 
exposed fake piece of evidence was based on real evidence or it's just a mix it it contains some truth and the person who was leaking it he had to put in false stuff so it's just this this generic response that is repeated over and over and over again right. and never never analysis. yeah yeah and never after all analysis. these all these failures never did they actually improve their methods never did they actually uh change the way they they handle intelligence you know like this well, uh, Jacques Vallée is is an exception. See, there the thing that is confusing is there is a reality. Um, there is there has always been uh, inexplicable phenomena. You know uh, whether it's uh, whether you, you're talking about the history of psychism. You know the the different psychic research organizations. Uh, I've experienced, for example, uh, spontaneous telepathy where. I was driving in a car with somebody who was quite angry and I knew there wasn't a left-hand turn lane and I knew he was going to get backed up and, and we were going to be late for lunch. And I kept thinking in my head, get in the left lane, get in the left lane now, you know? Um, uh, and um, he turned to me and he looked at me and he said, why did you tell me to, he changed lanes. And then he said, why did you tell me to get in the left lane? And I hadn't said it. I'd only thought it. So I've had, you know, people have those experiences. My grandmother had the experience of dreaming her sister Clara's death in, in Elgin, Illinois, uh, the night that her sister Clara died in childbirth. Um, and she, she, she had the dream, she nightmare really, woke up, told my grandfather, you know, sister Clara's dead. And he said, no, no, it's just a dream. In the morning, they got the telegram. Now, they were in British Columbia. They were in a different country. Um, and she had the dream. So, so people in their families, they have these experiences. And as I said about the Kennedy, uh, Lincoln, uh, synchronicities, there is this dimension of reality that's real. And of course, what these intelligence services and these conspirators in, um, in, in strategy using their groups to get advantage is they play off of the reality, which is a mystery that that we don't understand. And through the centuries, nobody's really understood any of this. Um, they play off of it, claiming that they have the answers, that they know what the answers are. And that if you join us, you'll know the answer too. And that we're the winning side, blah, blah, blah. And, and of course, if it's, as you pointed out, with revolutionary movements, with subversive movements to undermine the status quo is to say the government is in a conspiracy to hide this brilliant truth from you, the truth about aliens, the truth about God, the truth about the devil. You know, the devil's really a good guy, they might be telling you, like Anton LaVey. And these are, you could say that these are all intellectual weapons in this form of warfare that has not been that well understood by historians or the people that study these very subjects. Uh, sometimes I get activists, um, uh, UFO activists who get mad at me and they claim, why do you always mix this together? You know, the alien stuff and the UFO stuff. And they claim they're only interested in the, the UFO sightings or perceived sightings. And, um, and uh, so I, I usually suspect that these people are really into aliens, but they're not necessarily open about it. They just want to get people into this by using these perceived sightings and, and uh, these uh, stories are being told by various people. And so once they get people into this UFO thing, they can then get them deeper into this, into what they believe about, um, what they believe about aliens. Because at the end of the day, why would this supposed UFO phenomenon, why would it be relevant unless the al unless it has something to do with aliens and uh, the aliens would either have to be a threat to us a significant threat or they have they they can help us in a significant way because if they're not an enemy to us if they're not a threat to us and they can't really help us so what's the point of them you know we can't this would be really of no use to us so um i'm trying to uh look at this from um from the standpoint of what do people think they can get out of this or um, do people see this as a threat? Now, I, I mentioned this before, 
who is running this movement or who is really running the um, the key ideas of the movement? Who are these aliens? Why are they visiting us? What's their plan? And uh, if, the, if they are a threat, then, of course, the question is, uh, who can protect us from this threat? Maybe the Russians can protect us. Um, and nobody. If, <laughs> and if well, well, may, maybe this is one day. One day, some some Russian or some influencers will actually claim that your best hope is Russia to save you from the aliens. Um, That's and, possible. And the other scenario, if if the aliens are of great help to us, then this help might be conditional. So we have to give them something in order to get, let's say, the fancy new technology or whatever. So what do we have to give them? Who is uh, who is going to define or who is going to tell us what the well, price the what the price is for yeah. this help? The, the disturbing narrative that I notice in the UFO literature is that more and more among the people who believe in aliens and believe that there's this definite government secrecy by the US is this claim that's very alarming that the US government has a treaty with aliens. And that they're collaborating, but not with, with just any aliens. They're collaborating with the evil aliens, mm -hmm. the ones that are going to do something bad to humanity or going to enslave humanity. And, of course, who would, you know, you, you when you hear some piece of nonsense, you think, well, who benefits by this? Kui Bono is the big question always. Who's benefiting by this piece of nonsense? And it's like, well, yeah, Russia and China, because if you get a bunch of American citizens really upset that their government is collaborating if they believe in ufos and they believe their government is collaborating with evil aliens then the real problem is the u.s government the u.s government is a threat to mankind because the u.s is collaborating with evil aliens who have some sinister idea in mind for the future of humanity so therefore these disturbed ufo true believers could work with Soviet intelligence, could work with Chinese intelligence to save humanity from this evil American government that's coordinating with these evil, evil aliens. Um, this, this kind of narrative, it's no joke. Mm -hmm. It's really out there in the UFO literature. Yeah, I mean, I noticed something in, this was an old interview that was uh, conducted by um, a reporter from the Rolling Stone magazine, and he was interviewing Anton LaVey from the Church of Satan, which I just realized um, had a founding member from a 1,000-year-old family. And so um, um, this, this interviewer was, was asking LaVey, are you aware that you are creating uh, problems, you are creating chaos? If you tell everybody they're, 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 they can be like God, or they should act as if they had, uh, as if they were uh, much more than a human. Are, are you aware that this, this this will cause problems? And Levey admitted that yes, he just he plays to people's egos, and this has negative consequences. But in his logic, we are already in a phase of decline. Uh, a phase of destruction. So the only reasonable, or the only the, the only thing reasonable to do, is to um, accelerate this destruction. Uh, you accelerate this decline, so you can just get it over with. And by um, telling people to behave in a certain way, he thought he could uh, bring in this new age, so so to say, and. Um, and sort of this is kind of a baseline occultist logic. So you're supposed to just have fun, be focused, be focused on on your own interests, and uh, even if this damages other people. I mean, he t he talked about how much he hated people. He talked about this for hours. This reporter said, and um, so um, if if we draw a parallel from from this this occult um strategy right instead of building things instead of fixing things instead of repairing things and and creating things you're supposed to destroy and you're supposed to cause more problems um if we apply this to this uh some of these alien narratives i mean um some people may interpret that um that alien agenda as this is going to be like this big war, maybe uh, this 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 big fight against the aliens. And uh, once this is done, there will be something new, a new world. 
or or maybe the good aliens beat the bad aliens and after the storm is over we can all live in this happy communist system and and we get free energy and free everything yeah that's uh, that's pretty much how they do it and and of course people are so susceptible to this um because uh as i mentioned before what you just said uh, Karl Marx had had this, his whole formula is concrete reality, criticize it, criticize it, criticize it, then destroy it. Because your criticism, and that's how you you create by destroying. And and it, it fits with a poem that Marx wrote when he was in, in, in university. He wrote a poem in which he said that he could be the equal of God who created the world. He could be his equal if he could destroy the world and mankind. Yeah. And yeah, this that, was in the movie. Afraid... This was in the movie Prometheus, by the way. This was in Ridley Scott's movie Prometheus. So the same engineers that created us, they want to destroy us with this black liquid that that can destroy us. And so only if you can um, destroy something are you this thing's master. And of course, Marx had a special uh, thing that he said about Prometheus. Marx, Marx liked Prometheus. He favored Prometheus. Um, Prometheus, of course, in m Greek mythology, gave man fire, and but Prometheus was more famous for saying, "I hate the gods." Why do you give man fire? Because I hate the gods, right? Mm. Despite the gods, and so there's something about you know sticking your finger in God's eye, being opposed to God, being opposed to heaven. Um, this is uh, very definitely built into. Uh, modern socialism and the revolution. Um, and if people want to know why it ends in murder and mayhem and destruction and nothing really positive comes out of it, I think that you have your reason right there. Yeah, I mean, Marx's idea was that um, capitalism will inevitably cause, uh, capitalism will only cause damage and war and misery and destruction. So, um, if we look at if we look at um, the the first Alien movie by Ridley Scott, this seems to me like it's going in in sort of the same direction because uh, it it becomes sort of the the main plot point in the course of the movie uh, Alien from from 1979. It becomes imperative to destroy this organism before it reaches Earth, and it's the same thing in the sequel by James Cameron. Um, because these aliens reaching Earth, that would be like the the last stage of capitalism. Because a capitalist corporation, Weyland Utani and its complicit government, they would be responsible for bringing these deadly aliens to Earth, and that would destroy humanity. So that would fulfill the prophecy of Marx that capitalism will destroy everything uh, in the end. And so this is kind of an interesting yeah, parallel. Uh, yeah, it is. It, well, we see the, the the dialectical formula of concrete reality, criticize it, destroy. Um, and then you blame your victim. That's the other part they don't talk about is that is that you're basically going out to victimize uh, the people that exist, the system that exists. You know, human beings are not perfect. Any political system we make is not perfect. But you read all of history and you see how amazing a modern civilization is what its achievements are, the, hu the humane, the extreme humanity of it, um, uh, as opposed to earlier ages, where there was no concern for the individual, no concern for uh, the, the plight of the poor, for example. We have more of that, you know, uh, uh, modern uh, philanthropy, especially in America and Great Britain, has been tremendous, the, the sympathy, the empathy that, that people have, that wealthy people have had, in the West, and in, in especially in, in the uh, Anglosphere. Um, yet n none of that is credited. The whole thing is rotten. It has to be dragged mm. down. For what? For what they have in China? I, I think um, uh, a friend of mine who lived in China a couple of years, she said um, uh, when she went to China, they have in China, they have one expression for people who are in dis distress. It's you hold out your hand and you go like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> people, are, we, we're not going to help. We're not going to help you. Um, and, uh, in, in Russian society too, uh, there is this, um, mis misanthropy that you don't find in the West. 
Um, and, and we see it, in the, like I say again, in the Ukraine war, we see it in China's treatment of Tibet and the Uyghurs, uh, in, in China's uh, readiness to threaten uh, the most horrible consequences to any country that dares to do anything against them, even to acknowledge the existence of Taiwan. And of course, Russia's been threatening nuclear war ever since it claimed the right to invade the second largest country in Europe and annex mm. it. Um, uh, it. It's just monstrous. And yet our media, our culture insists that we are the monsters, that anyone that approves of the military industrial complex that defends us, mm. that defends our liberty, has kept us alive against Russian nuclear rockets for all these years, that they're somehow the prime evil on the planet, that the CIA, the gang that could never shoot straight, is the <laughs> is behind every single conspiracy and every bad thing that happened from 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 Roswell to the Kennedy assassination to uh, well maybe the the CIA was the snake in the Garden of Eden. And they sank you know? the Titanic I mean, they and <laughs> sank the Titanic. Sure, it was the iceberg. It actually the iceberg they, was the CIA guy was inside the iceberg, right? It's a holographic so iceberg, it, and no, no, but but this is something. Yeah, yeah you um you, you just mentioned this thought that um. You know that this that the this thing that is propagated that humans are are the monsters. If if you watch uh, if you watch James Cameron's uh, movie Aliens, there's sort of this underlying respect that is being uh, shown, this underlying respect to these uh, aliens. Um, and uh, so, for example, these colonial marines and they represent. The, the military industrial complex, right? So these colonial marines, they go in, they think it's an easy operation, they think it's an easy task. At first, they're very, very uh, enthusiastic, and they're very full of themselves. Um, but when the situation becomes really dire and dangerous, um, they the marines sort of fall apart. So they become individuals, they kind of turn on each other. Uh, one of them just uh, just gives in to fear, and um, yeah, and this is this one corporate guy who is trying to sell them all out and and uh, try to get the specimen home. So the humans are scheming against each other, and uh, um, there's this one moment where the the main character, Lieutenant Ripley, um, uh, she has this line where she compares these hum the humans uh, to these aliens and she says, well, at least these aliens don't screw each other over for a percentage. And this was sort of a, a really strong hint that in, in the movie, um, sort of these, these aliens are almost like these aliens are almost like like the real hero heroes of the movie, right? Because they are this 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 rare species, and they are selfless. These selfless, almost communist, uh, communist ideal, selfless warriors. They will sacrifice themselves for for the for the collective. There's this one scene that was not in the um, cinematic version, but was later uh, put back in into the director's cut. It's this moment where the colonial marines they put up these automatic um, these these. Automa um, automatically uh, targeting guns, these sentry guns, and they put them into these, these this hallway. And so they stare at these monitors where they can um, observe how much ammo is still left in these systems. And they expect an attack from these from these aliens. And so they hear the gunfire and the, the, the ammunition counter goes lower and lower and lower, but these aliens, they keep coming and coming and coming and coming. So they are the ideal of the communist, uh, the communist fighters who will sacrifice themselves for the collective. Uh, whereas the humans, they turn on each other, and they are they're individualistic, and they just uh, they, they're not the same. They're not perfect warriors. No. No. Um, yeah. No. That's interesting. Is that the alien that is the threat to human life is really the good guy. And of course, that reminds me, I had, there was a communist I knew in graduate school. He was very high up in, in the academic system. And he, uh, he basically decided he didn't even like communism anymore. He thought humanity should be extinct. He just thought humanity should cease to exist. That became his, mm -hmm. his final statement, that humanity was not worth saving. Um, 
and you think about this, um, you know, I, I think about, uh, of course, uh, Soren Kierkegaard's um, um, uh, The Sin of Despair, um, which, which, he, which he wrote in, in one of his books. Uh, the Sin of Despair is really the opposite of faith. Despair and faith are opposites. So you have the book of Job, and you it, it seems to me very important that in the book of Job, they say, well, God has done all these horrible things to you. Just curse God and die, and Job won't do that. Um, and that is, to me, uh, the ultimate statement is that, that you have faith that God is going to make everything good in the end, and that it's all going to somehow be worth it, that we're here for a reason. And even though we don't understand what that reason is, our job is to endure. And the Gnostic position, the the position of despair is, no, don't endure, curse God and die. Nothing here is worth anything. It's all for nothing. And that is the nihilism that really underlines, underlies National Socialism, Communism, and all of these, you could say, heresies and um, really, quite frankly, brutal approaches and it's it, it this brutality as you just pointed out is in our movies it's in our science fiction especially but it's in all of these really sophisticated dramatic presentations um in fact there's a there's a series uh, i think they're children's books and i saw the series on hbo which is a completely gnostic uh uh thing and it's got interdimensional travel between our reality and this other reality this alternate reality and i'm forgetting the name of it but it was it's it really has all these themes built into it and um and it's very it's very anti-christian particularly in its uh in in its message and but this is the thing that they're pushing on everyone now this is the theme yeah and that's um over here in europe i mean quite a uh, quite a few um, right-wing uh, right-wing extremists are into uh, this UFO stuff, especially tied to uh, tied to the Nazi era. I mean, there's been so many myths that have been created. Uh, you know, the, the, the flying saucer program of the Nazis and um, these these uh, occult um, these occult programs to to um, find secret hidden places these occult places in i think it was india these expeditions that were done um and also um this this idea that hitler was hitler was channeling spirits from a specific planet and we could actually visit this planet or these beings can visit us so there's there's a lot of uh, mythology that was created uh back in the day and also after world war ii and uh, I noticed something. Um, I noticed a, a specific connection to to the United States as well. Um, well, it's this, in the Grush testimony. Actually, they've brought that in in the Grush testimony. The stuff that the first alleged UFO captured <laughs> by the U.S. government was from was handed over by Mussolini, and they had okay. a, apparently it crashed from a some kind of test in Munich, Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, back in 1932, you know, even uh, before the National Socialists took power in Germany, which is so, bizarre. So, it, so somebody bizarre. could be throwing a bone. Somebody could be throwing a fake bone towards uh, a certain uh, crowd in the audience. And uh, I yeah. so so I saw so I saw this thing when um, when the uh, the Church of Satan in America became a thing, and it was tied into, of course, the 1960s rock music movement. Um, people in the church of satan they um they at some point pretty fairly quickly people had exhausted what the church could offer and so they were looking at all these other places and so um you had offshoots and then they were creating even more offshoots and this is sort of where the connection comes into the the, the nazi ufo stuff how this was or how how even um uh, occultist um, Nazi or even German uh, German occultism how this was uh, brought to America uh, in a larger way so for example uh, first you had uh, Michael Aquino who found who founded his own group the Temple of Seat this was a clear that, that, that's really that Aquino story is weird because again he was involved in psychological warfare operations exactly in the US and military. And of course, the by naming it the Temple of Seed, uh, this was of course a 
a clear connection to ancient mystery cults. So it was not this baseline black robes, pentagrams and, and candles and stuff, but it was more connected to the actual uh, the actual past. And I've mentioned this Baroness from Denmark, from this thousand year old family, um, this this Baroness who was the founding member of the Church of Satan, and she may have been sort of a, a connecting a connecting person between the real elite cults and something like the uh, the, the Church of Satan. And so, and, and of course, I should point out that these uh, that the infiltration of the Masonic movement by the communists goes way back. In fact, it even goes back further than what we find uh, mentioned in Julius Evola, the, the recent biography of Julius Evola, that the he was working for the SS. They were gathering information on the Masonic and occult lodges in Europe. They were stockpiling it in Vienna. And of course, the Soviet army captured it. But the Soviets recognized that these aristocratic groups and these cults were the key to their infiltration of Europe as far back as the 1920s, didn't they? It's, uh, yeah, exactly. especially this, this, this Evola guy, his stuff is being read today. I mean, this, he, he always oh, yeah. had one comeback after the other. So the French, the French right wing was, I think he was, they were rediscovering him in the 70s. And then he was rediscovered again in the 80s and the 90s. And, and uh, people nowadays, they're rediscovering him again. So and all Steve these Bannon likes him. Yeah, yeah, it's Bannon likes him, and m yeah. many of these new right wing guys, uh, they are into psychedelics. And there's a study on this I found recently. Um, I can I can quote this in the in the movie uh, in in the video description. Um, there's a study on how many people in the right wing are actively promoting the use of psychedelics, and so um, so this this uh, Michael Aquino guy, he became uh, he became interested in. Uh, Nazi occultism and so in in 1983 he performed a ritual at uh, the subterranean section of the infamous Wewelsburg castle in Germany which was also utilized as a ceremonial space by the Schutzstaffels Ahnen Erbe group during the Nazi period uh, and uh, this ritual resulted in his formation of the Order of the Trapezoid, a Satian offshoot group whose members understood themselves as a chivalric order of knights. So um, he's taking you around the world, it seems, right? So it's it started with the Church of Satan, which was this baseline, you know, pentagram, inverted cross stuff. Then the Temple of Sat going back to the ancient world. And uh, then he's he's he brings us to uh, the Nazi occultism, and then he's going back to the old um, the older centuries with the the knights and um, and these sort of orders. I mentioned the Knights Templars, and uh, the big question of who was um, trying to find out what um, what what the Templars were into or may have been into, and uh, so. So then the story continues from 1987 through uh, to, uh, until 1995. The Grand Master of the Order of the Trapezoid was uh, Edred Torson, real name Stephen Flowers. So he had studied mm. academic runology at the University of Göttingen in Germany uh, under Klaus Duvel and. Uh, so these these leading academics there and um so in 1978 flowers joined the asatru free assembly uh the largest neo völkische organization in the united states so this is one of the connections where they bring this stuff from europe um to america and to the americans um germany or especially uh, europe in general um, seems ominous and very, very mysterious, right? Because uh, I, this, this, this is reflected in all the horror movies. You know, anything, anything German, anything European is is uh, viewed as very, very sinister. And some of these um, European, some of this European stuff then uh, made its way to uh, United States East Coast. I think the the Salem 
stuff, for example. This was in New England or something. Salem witch trials. So okay, this was this was like right? this was like New New England type area. Mm -hmm. In the late 17th century, the well, what happened? Um, um, Cotton Mather, who was a famous clergyman, his letters were very famous. There was a um, an old washerwoman in uh, she was Irish, and she was insulted by a couple of girls in the community there in Boston. And this lady put a this old Irish lady put a hex on her on these two girls. They started vomiting nails and pins. They they would I forget whether they levitated or not, but they were they went through horrible. It was like a possession, demonic affliction kind of thing. And the community there, they'd never seen anything like it. They were Puritans, of course, and they wrote to Europe, where of course there had been experience with witch trials and so on, and. They didn't want to execute this old woman for doing this, but they didn't. They were beside themselves. And Mather was a traveling preacher, and he came back and he said, "Oh, this is ridiculous. This can't be happening." And then he interviewed the the two girls that were afflicted and saw that it was really happening, and went to visit the old Irish lady in jail. And he said, "My dear, you're you're a Christian, right?" "Well, yeah, I'm a Catholic." And but you 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 know that it's witchcraft is against you know Christianity. You can't do that to anyone. Well, they insulted me, and I talked to my prince, and my prince is is you know I'm never going to give up my prince, and my prince has these powers, and I I did this to these two girls, and he tried to reason with her and get her to remove the curse. And he said, you know they're going to hang you. They've written to Europe, and this is the procedure. Witchcraft is a capital offense. And she said, I don't care. I won't remove the curse. And they did end up hanging this woman. And um, they had a terrible time. He took one of the girls into his home and found that only in his study was she normal. And that he accounted, this is a bizarre account. And Mather was a very sober, intelligent, educated man. This, the, this girl would be seen like riding an animal, an invisible animal around the place, and it would break through doors, and it would go through places in the house and make a huge mess. And there were you know, lots of witnesses to this. And eventually, what Mather did is he formed a prayer circle. Uh, and they just, a giant prayer circle, and they prayed, and, and these girls got better. But this Mather's letters became famous in New England about this event and triggered a witch hysteria outside of Boston in Massachusetts, at Salem particularly. Uh, have you ever heard the story before? No, no, I'm not, not familiar and with this. And the historians this. agree that what happened in Salem was a, a kind of hysteria. But the, it's just like with UFOs. Somebody sees something that's maybe real, that's been a phenomenon for thousands of years, it gets into people's heads, it gets exaggerated, it creates a hysteria, it creates a movement. Well, this is what you had here happen in New England. Mm -hmm. uh, I think country. this is... But if you um, read Mather and you read the... His, even a, a, I, there was a Jewish historian that wrote a biography of Mather and he said, well, this does appear to have actually happened. You know? I think this and, is... I think this is... The, this this whole underlying thing, I think, is very, very much reflected in American horror cinema. Because now it's it's yes. hello it's Halloween season, right? So people rewatch oh, yeah. all of these all these classic horror movies, and um, it, it I mean the 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 most successful or the um, uh, most well known um, American horror movies they usually uh, the story usually revolves around uh, some sort of an object from either Europe or something from Europe or even further. Uh, from the old Mesopotamia region, and somehow this object ends up in America, this this occultic um, thing, and uh, somebody is somehow accessing uh, the, the this occult uh, object or this occult power, and then of course all hell breaks loose. This is uh, basically the storyline of uh, Sam Raimi's The Evil Dead. Uh, this is the story of uh, The Exorcist from 1973, I think it was. And uh, this is sort of this is something you see over and over again. I mean, I recently rewatched some of these uh, some of these films. And um, for example, in uh, the, the Evil Dead from the 1980s, um, 
it's it's a story of, of these these young Americans, and they they go to this cabin in the mountains, and they find this tape recorder, and uh, they find this this uh, this ancient book of the dead, and they find this ancient dagger. And so the recording on the machine is from a scientist, a researcher who found this stuff, uh, found this stuff with the incantations from an old Sumerian. He found it in an old Sumerian temple. And he brings the stuff to America. And these, these, these young idiots, they play the whole recording, including the incantation. And that's when the spirits, uh, the evil spirits that are partially even there already, they're then activated and they all get possessed. Um, they all get possessed by this really, really evil demon. And uh, the, the Exorcist, uh, the original movie, it starts, the movie starts basically in ancient Mesopotamia. It, it's, it's this excavation in Iraq. The first shot of the movie is the sun, like the sun gods. And uh, so um, in, the, in this uh, excavation, they find this little figure of the ancient Pazuzu demon and this Catholic priest, um, this Catholic priest sees the little figure. He also see, uh, looks at the faces off against this bigger demon statue. And then he gets recalled to, um, well, the East Coast, like Wash I think it's Washington, D.C., uh, the Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Er uh, area. And, and he's supposed to go there to perform an exorcism. Um, because somehow this, this demonic force made its way, uh, to America, to the United States. Well, and, you've got H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and the story of Cthulhu, right? And the story of these, these, uh, and of course this is, uh, uh, tremendously imaginative, but, and, and it has had quite an effect. Uh, part of the reality be behind that is that in the 1820s, or no, I'm sorry, 1840s, they were digging through Azure Bonnie Pauls, the 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 one of the last Assyrian kings. They were digging through his library. They found it, and they had all this cuneiform, all these books. And one of the books you can access this online. It's the Summoning of the Seven Wicked Spirits, uh, and it is creepy. You just you start to read it, and it's it's so evil. It gives you such a bad feeling. You have to stop. You can't really you feel there's something even in translation this is originally in an ancient Sumerian not even in um, Babylonian or Assyrian which are Semitic languages um, and uh, it seems that uh, Azerbaijan captured this document uh, cuneiform tablets when he took Babylon during his reign he laid siege to Babylon and plundered it and he wanted these occult books and of course, what, what's ironic is across the street from Azure Bonnie Paul's library were all of these occult books about raising evil spirits. Uh, they have the House of Exorcisms <laughs> across the street, the ruins of the House of Exorcisms. So this stuff is, is goes back a long ways. And these old kings, Assyrian and Babylonian and whatnot, they're fighting over these ta control of these tablets, which mm. is rather curious. And of course, You've got Nebuchadnezzar. The story of Nebuchadnezzar is very strange because you wonder if Nebuchadnezzar isn't possessed when he when he starts to act like an animal at, at one point, right? He's the guy that destroyed Jerusalem, laid siege to it, and that's when the um, Ark of the Covenant disappeared. But uh, and of course, this was the, the the great Babylonian captivity, where the prophet Daniel was taken uh, in captivity to. Uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, and you had Meshach, Shadnach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and so on. But Nebuchadnezzar is one of these tyrant, these evil tyrant types, and um, and his family is ultimately overthrown by the Persians. But um, and of course, he is the one who destroyed Assyria and laid waste probably to that same palace with those those books um, in cuneiform writing. But this is this goes back to. Uh, a long way in history um, uh, and of course we don't even fully understand what these practices were about you know how they related to Egypt and Israel and ancient Mesopotamia uh, they know that during the Babylonian captivity under Jewish houses I think that they found in Babylon were these talismans buried under the houses um, 
I've read about. So there's been all kinds of strange beliefs and magical practices throughout history. Um, and it, it's, it's, some of it is, a lot of it is nonsense, but some of it, there's some kind of reality there. Yeah, I was interested. Uh, I, f I was very, very um, surprised when I read uh, this book by Adrian Mayer. It's called uh, uh, Greek Fire, Greek Fire, Scorpion Bombs, and a few other things. It's quite a long title. And um, she's studied ancient biological warfare, and she... Uh, um, she requested the help of other scientists, so ranging from archaeologists to modern experts on biology. And what they could piece together was that um, biological warfare was actually a thing in the ancient world. And it was not just the limited, um, these, these limited techniques that were previously known, for example, the poisoned arrows and um, poison arrow tips and redirecting streams or poisoning streams so the enemy's drinking water is contaminated or um but it, it it was actually more advanced than this so um there are instances of um one empire um placing diseased animals i think it was anthrax uh placing diseased animals um somewhere where the enemy would then pick up these animals um, because they believed they, these were just stray animals. And so they were taking this disease back to their home. And there's also mentionings of diseased people, especially uh, young women being sent, into the, uh, sent to the enemy. And so it's difficult to reconstruct a single operation, but the overall picture is really, really fascinating. So I th um, it's, it's also tied to the mythology and to the mystery cults, because some gods like Apollo, they were tied to this idea of diseases and some of the um, iconography depicts some of these gods as, um, uh, as, if they were, as if they were fighting a disease or the, the hydra, the many-headed hydra, this is the, the, or the, the black arrows. There was these invisible black arrows of death that were mentioned um, in the ancient world. So they, they had a, um, a concept of biological warfare. And there's some there's there's some informed speculation that uh, they were using certain um, certain vessels made out of I think it was copper and silver, and so they could have um, stockpiles of um, infectious materials, and these stockpiles would be in specific uh, temples. So that is kind of the scientific theory there, and it's it's there, like there this, were it's, some Roman. So I, there were some Roman thinkers that speculated that there were germs that were too small to be seen. Exactly. That were exactly. responsible for illness. Yeah. So they exactly. did have some kind of conception. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, um, and it's kind of this, this idea that is reflected even in, in modern horror movies, uh, modern horror cinema, that you have sort of a vessel tied to occult, um, tied to occult things. And if you open this vessel, all hell will break loose. So... Just like in, in, in The Exorcist, when somebody becomes possessed, or in The Evil Dead, when they, when they, uh, they uh, play this, this tape recording and then everybody gets possessed, or even the zombie movies. You know, some of the, um, some of the, the famous uh, zombie movies, they never explained where, why the zombies even, um, even appeared. I mean... It was ins I think it was insinuated in Night of the Living Dead that um, some American satellite was causing this. And uh, there was another uh, zombie movie where some American military gas um, was causing the dead to rise from the graves. So it was kind of this this old idea from the 70s and the, and, and the 80s. Never, that it's never always blame Karl Marx for people who... Who act like zombies and eat other people's brains? <laughs> yeah, or the 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 famous Dawn of the Dead movie where um, the characters they escape to this um, shopping mall. This was, I think, a movie from 1979, Dawn of the Dead. So they escape to the shopping mall and they defend the shopping mall and they own it and they have everything and they don't want to share it. But then some motorcycle gang arrives and they try to take the mall from them. Yeah, this and and you see the sh you see the the zombies in the like the shoppers, you know, walking around. And um, <laughs> one of the characters asks, "Why do they come here? Why do these zombies come here?" And the answer is, "Well, this 
um, this is the place they liked in their lives. So this stupid consumerism, supposedly, this is what they were all about. And so this was this was in those movies. But it's it's always like this. There's this origin of of the problem, and then it spreads like a disease. Somebody has opened Pandora's box, and then everybody gets affected by it. So this is something you see over and over in these movies. Yeah, the zombie apocalypse is always the the capitalists and the consumers, never never the communists. And and they'll put Nazis. There's Nazi zombie movies too. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you're not going to see one uh, where it's the communist bloc or the zombies. I don't think. Um, but it's it's the the thing is is that if you want to, you know, and I think this is where where Eric Vergelin is interesting uh, more and more to me, is that when he's saying that people people there's this negativity which is characterized in this marxist philosophy and nazi philosophy where you have to go to violence you have to go to destruction because everything is so bad that's the only way out and um this this destructiveness it's it's not a fantasy it is what is in these people's heads and it's manifested in reality through regimes like the Nazi and communist regimes and like the rising wokeism in the United States and the horrors we saw that Hamas did last weekend. It's, it's, and we don't have any real uh, proper way of talking about it. All people can do is use this wokeism, attack capitalism, attack white privilege, uh, attack heterosexuals and attack Christianity. That's all they do. Yeah, I mean, some people actually, uh, I mean, even today, some people actually believe that uh, national socialism could have worked out in the end if um, if World War II had um, had ended differently. But people never, uh, people like this, people in the extreme right wing, they never try to run a credible scenario. How would that? How would this have evolved? Right. So. Um, it's this. It's this. Um, there was this plan to rebuild Berlin and and call the or make a new capital city and call it Germania and have all these Roman style buildings that were larger than any other Roman style building in the world. I mean, Hitler was obsessed with this sort of um, uh, th- these sort of structures, these sort of buildings, and he even made his chief architect Albert Speer the head of the um, the war production and the war procurement which was a a really odd choice and um it's of course um, many people wrote about hitler and um hitler and occultism and and quite a bit of what was written is 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 false it's not really it's not really true but um i i'm looking into this myself i mean some academics have looked into this i mean there's this one book by this british guy um like a Cambridge guy, an Oxford guy, I forgot his name, the occult roots of, what was it, National Socialism. It's one yeah, of the standard... I've read that book. Yeah, 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 I have a copy too. It's one of the standard works, but he's, he's, he's being a total academic. He's not thinking like an intelligence guy at all. So he just he's just going from, you know, baseline sources, and he says it's yeah. it, the occultism was not a big thing with the Nazis. Um, but the thing to remember about Hitler is that um, he was always, always trying his hardest to move up the ranks by any means necessary. So at some point he was getting into occultism. Um, he was collecting this um, this uh, this um, magazine called Ostara and he had every single edition. He even went to the publisher in his early days when he was broke. He tried to buy the last uh, um, issues that he didn't already possess. And so he was really into this, but at some point, and I think this is even in Mein Kampf, at some point he started to talk down to um, the the uh, the Germanic occultism of the time because he thought of these groups as too weak. So this is something you can find over and over with Hitler. He was getting into something new and when it, this new thing had exhausted its, um, use, its, its usefulness, he found something that was more elite, it was more exclusive, and then he was trash-talking the thing he was into before. So he was moving, yeah, up, yeah. He was moving up the ranks in society, and especially in Munich. Uh, Munich and other parts of Germany, you can find some really, really old stuff. Um, 
hard to document, but um, there are some because let's face it, um, Munich is really, really close to um, or southern Germany is really, really close to uh, where ancient Rome was or at some point the south of Germany was part of Rome. And this is sort of when the the Romans met with the Germans and and these two mythologies met. So the Germans had their own cults, their older cults. And this is where it all met. And this is the place, Bavaria, where Hitler became a successful politician. So there's quite a bit of scary ancient stuff uh, going around. And that is far more was far more elite than um, what Hitler had been into in his early days. So he was trash talking like the, the, the baseline occultists. He called them cowards. They would not fight the communists in a physical sense. They were just posers and all that. But all the time, Hitler was moving up and up and up the ranks of society. And, and um, so he was up, constantly upgrading his um, uh, constantly upgrading his occultism um, along the way. And, um, and uh, his, his fancy, he was, always, he was always a big fan of ancient Rome. That was his, his, uh, his great uh, passion, the, the Roman Empire. And that's why if you're at, at Nuremberg here in, in Bavaria, you can see these old buildings. There's one of the buildings here. It's it looks like the the, um, the Emperor Augustus Colosseum in, from Rome. It's almost a replica. And this is in Nuremberg. This is right next to the area where they had these big Nazi rallies. So this this was all yes. ba- based on based on Rome. So so the obvious thing to investigate is um, Hitler's connection to old systems of occultism and. Um, it, be it mystery cults or be it some some later variation of those mystery cults. So this needs to be looked at. You can't just go and read the baseline academic academic books or read the mythology that's being spread around. You have to go deeper than that. Well, there was his connection to Dietrich Eckhart, yes. uh, who was in fact um, a translator, the German translator of... Um, the Norwegian playwright um, Ibsen and Ibsen's Peer Gent, Ibsen's, you know, it's very funny. There's a book called um, Hitler and I think it's called Hitler and Ibsen. Uh, and, and it's, uh, I have it back here on the shelf. And it's, it's, I don't know if, if you've ever had a look at it. I, I think I mentioned it to you last week, but this is a very strange book because this guy, he got, uh, funding, I think, through the Holocaust Museum to to turn this paper he did into a book. What he discovered was that in Hitler's speeches and writings were major plagiarisms from Ibsen's writings, Ibsen's plays. And for example, uh, Ibsen wrote, um, what was it, The Master Builder, right? A play about an architect. Well, architect the whole architect thing is big with Hitler, as you well know. It isn't just Albert Speer. Hitler was aspiring to be an architect. Then there was, I think the play was called Ghosts. It was about syphilis. And of course, this story about Hitler having syphilis. Um, There was the enemy of the people, which was about a doctor who finds that the town's water supply is is poisoned by some kind of bacterium. And of course, um, the Jews are described by Hitler as this poisonous Um, germ in society that has to be combated and so that there's things taken from this play in Hitler's speeches and and on it goes and here is Eckhart an occultist a member of the Thule Society who was the translator of Ibsen into German and this is so strange I mean I read the book twice because it so boggled my mind but there's no doubt he's onto something because you can't literally have verbatim plagiarisms on that scale without some kind of explanation. Right. Right. Um, and so it's almost like there was a template. And of course, as I mentioned before, occultists use metaphor and simile, and they use they use these structures that are similar from place to place. There's like a template, and it seems like. And Eckhart once was quoted as making the statement, you know, um, Hitler will dance and we've called the tune. So he's going to do basically what we've programmed him to do. What does that mean? 
you know, is there, was there some kind of secret Ibsen CODIS? Was Ibsen into the occult? Hmm. What, what is behind this? Have you ever heard of this before? Um, no, not that, but I've been looking into, um, I've been looking into the recent studies of, um, studies about these, these really, really old families. I mean, going back a thousand years, going back 1200 years, um, these old families, um, they, they did join the NS, NSDAP party, uh, Hitler's party. Uh, quite a quite a few of them, and uh, they joined quite early as well. So um, uh, this has been interpreted by researchers in different ways. So the standard interpretation is that the aristocracy in Germany uh, they they lost their status after World War One, and and of course this is true. Um, the um, the nobility uh, the nobility was was officially ended, so you still had the name. You still had the prestige, um, but you did not have um, the the official power that you had before uh, on German territory, and so the standard interpretation says, well, these um, aristocrats they 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 crave more power again, and they saw the National Socialist Party as a way to uh, to attain greater power, and um, and this I think is a very very lame uh, reading of history. Um, because these families, they, they had uh, tremendous wealth and they had tremendous power and they had way more territory because um, especially the oldest of these families, uh, the Welfen, for example, Welfen families, they go back to at least the year 800 and they claim they go back even further, taking over from, from the Roman Empire. And... Uh, in in 17, 1714, Britain's uh, new king was what, someone from the Welfen line, uh, King King George the First, and so um, this is a very 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 large family, and he tried to keep a low profile, and meanwhile his his family members and their assets, they were flooding Britain. I mean they've been doing this for a while. Um, this is how they got the removed the Stuarts from power, basically. So you have these very old families, um, Welfen, Vettina, Reginare, and these sublineages with names that are more commonly known, because these names also describe the places they controlled, such as uh, Hessen or Schleswig-Holstein. Um, but um, these old families, they had new territory. They they had they they were in Britain, they were in Denmark. Um, they, you know, Britain had these colonies. Uh, these families also moved quite a few assets into the United States. This is also something I'm, I'm currently researching. These old British sort of networks that were built uh, in the United States after the revolution. And uh, so what, what would be the point? Why would these old families support these crazy Nazis? Uh, why would they support them to gain more power? They already had vast amount of power and territory why would they uh, even mess with the nazis so this this um this baseline reading of history is not really convincing to me so as i've said very old families so they probably were involved in some very old mystery cults and this of course uh, uh probably relates to to hitler as well so let's say a guy like eckhart can connect Hitler to some other per some other people, and Hitler wanted to move up the ranks. And there's some there's there's quite a bit of um, historical evidence that some of these old families, um, these old families, they really helped Hitler's uh, rise to to power. So, for example, the old uh, von der Schulenburg clan. Uh, they sort of prevented the last ditch effort to keep Hitler away from power. So this was when uh, this this was like in 19, 1932, 33. Uh, there was a chance of mobilizing the troops, uh, just removing the Nazis from from the places of power they already had, and then reestablishing some normal system. But this last ditch effort was subverted by, for example, the uh, Schulenburg family. And so 
it is likely um, these these old families would have tried to recruit Hitler for some sort of more elite um, occult system, and um, and and forging these forging these ties. And some of these ties have never been properly looked at, because remember, the Nazis had this idea of. Um, making a deal with Britain and the United States. So um, because yes. because yeah. these three empires, they were all white people, basically. So this was sort of... A, well, they, they focused on using Hitler. They wanted Hitler to move in the direction of the Soviet Union. And right. there was even in Mein Kampf a reference to, you know, reigniting the Russian Civil War by by going into Ukraine, by detaching Ukraine and, and refighting the, you know, the whites versus the reds. There was in Germany in the 1920s still significant number of, of Russian uh, Russian refugees who were willing to take up arms again and go back. Right, and it's just like when when the Nazi Party was um, when the Nazi Party was gaining traction in the 1920s and then the, the early 1930s, the party was always broke. They, they were bleeding money everywhere because they tried to impress people with these big rallies. And they had the, uh, the SA group going around beating up people um, opposing uh, um, the Nazis. So all of this cost money and they were constantly running out of money. And always magically new money was appearing from, uh, various, from various sources. And so usually you would expect a quid pro quo uh from these these old families so if 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 they are in negotiations with the the nazi party they would say well uh we can work together but um you have we have to bring you into this into this uh thing that we've we've cultivated for so long so we can we can trust each other more so this is likely the way uh the way things were played and so um and so it, it's not surprising to me that um, British historians have refused to look at this, and also German historians um, have refused to look at this. So they just go by this. Just like Russian is, historians refuse to look at Stalin's role in bringing Hitler to power. Right, right. And um, it seems like Hitler played all the sides to get where he wanted to go. Yeah, but even even when uh, when uh, uh, when Hess made his weird trip to Britain in this in the small airplane, um, th the point of this trip, as 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 far as we can reconstruct it, um, the point of this trip was to uh, to meet with his contact people in Britain from the aristocracy. There were quite a few um, uh, connections, the Haushofer Haushofer connection and and more. So there was, this was supposed to be a meeting to make some sort of a, a thing happen, to make some sort of a deal happen. And um, yeah, there was this plan of the Nazis to um, to to bring this one guy to the to, to get this one guy uh, to the British throne who was who was sort of pro-Nazi. Um, so the Nazis really believed they had a, a deep-rooted connection to the old aristocracy, because um, in in the Nazi mind. Uh, in the Nazi uh, view of history, these old German aristocrats, um, these old German families, uh, th uh, th these these old German families, they had lost power, uh, lost power to the Jewish conspiracy. So, um, well, especially especially in Britain, especially in Britain. Yeah. So Britain was taken well, over course. by the Rothschilds, and so right. we have, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that kind of was the weird. If 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 Hitler really believed that, it really undid him in the end because he was wrong. And um, but but the interesting thing is that, that Hitler, the aristocrats, g got a snitful of Hitler and felt that Hitler was bad in the end. And Hitler wanted to eradicate them. I think it's in Table Talk, where Hitler talks about uh, after the war he's going to eradicate the aristocrats. He's going to hang them all. Yeah, he was, he was he was so full of himself. Time. Yeah, he was so full of himself. He thought of um in a way he thought of these aristocrats as um as losers because they had lost they had lost power, especially lost power to the Jewish conspiracy. For example, like in England, but also in 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 Germany because for the longest time Germany was not a unified empire. It was just these little bits and pieces. And um and Hitler also, um, Hitler also hated the old Austrian 
aristocracy because he thought it was so weak it was no match for the old Roman Empire. It didn't hold a candle to the Roman Empire. So these aristocrats were doing it wrong and Hitler thought he was doing a much better job. But to this was like his game. He was always trying to move up in society, gain somebody's help and then ditch them. But um, mm -hmm. he was he was getting into some some families and he underestimated these families, I think, in a in a in a big way. And uh, and uh, he was. Uh, he thought he could use their help, but these families, they for a long time, they had infiltrated the uh, right wing extreme movement um, starting at somewhere around 1850. So this is this is around the time when the, the communists, uh, the communists ditched the whole Jewish conspiracy thing, which was actually quite popular in the uh, French, uh, French early socialism. They invented this whole Jewish conspiracy thing. So the, the communists ditched this idea, the right wing was picking it up. But I've, I've systematically looked at all the major right wing organizations from 18, um, 1850 to the Nazi, um, uh, the Nazi power grab. And pretty much all of them had, um, pretty much all of these groups had members from these very, very old families. And they were putting money into it. They were involved in occultism um, going back quite a long time, and also um, they they could establish these these uh, intelligence circles. And um, some people from these old families, um, I think uh, it was the the um, the Mecklenburg aristocracy in the north. Uh, these Mecklenburg families, I think uh, the Reventlov clan, I think they ran. Um, Martin Bormann, the big trader, who uh, because he was involved with them. Bormann in his early days, he was heavily involved with these families, and um, and and the the uh, this is sort of the this is sort of the massive Bormann danger. Was a double agent, a triple agent? No, I think he was. I think Bormann was originally cultivated by um, the the Mecklenburg aristocracy, um, but um, some so of these acquired him. Some of these, some of these aristocrats, they came, they became involved with with the whole communist thing, and uh, mm. and and they got somehow they got themselves involved, and it's not really clear if if somebody higher up, if somebody turned and started to work for the communists, um, this this turncoat would have inherited an asset like uh, like Bormann, and for some reason Bormann was willing to give up all the secrets to the Russians. And so this is this is kind of the danger because many people came out of these um, right wing groups and joined the NSDAP, but uh, there were quite a bit of uh, spooks in there, quite a bit of traitors in there. So if they could turn one of the leaders of one of these groups, they could turn all the agents over to the Russian system. I mean, even even if this even if these these people who probably ran Bormann, um, these people could have. I mean, even if these people who ran Bormann, even if these people primarily worked for Britain um, and Britain's aristocracy because of the family relations. Even if they worked for the Britons, they could have still decided to give away the German military secrets to the Russians. Interesting. Well, we've gone two and a half hours now <laughs> and uh, we covered so many things. Oh my gosh. I can't believe how much stuff we've covered, Alex. Uh, Alex Benish, thank you so much. And I'm Jeff Nyquist. And I want to thank those who have uh, probably, hopefully, have listened to this a half hour at a time here and there, and you've you've caught a lot of it. But um, it's it's been sort of a super seminar on uh, espionage, the occult, and all the various aspects of well, it. Well, it's so, creepier. It's creepier than any horror movie out there for for Halloween. It, I can guarantee it, you it that. Is, it is a Halloween theme, no doubt about it. And uh, and there's even more. We we really this subject is not easy to exhaust, is it? No, no, it's not. I think the, no, not. the big secrets are still out there. They are. Well, thank you, Alex, and thank you, folks, for listening.